Good evening. I call this Iowa City Community School Board meeting on uh, Tuesday, March 10th, 2020 to order. My name is Janet Godwin, and I want to thank those in the audience for joining us tonight. I'll start by introducing those at the table with me. To my right, Superintendent Steve Murley, Directors Lisa Williams, Paul Ressler, Sean Eystone. Uh, to my left, J.P. Clausen, Charlie Eastham, and Kim Colvin, Recording Secretary. The public is reminded that they wish to speak. They need to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in. During community comment, persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda items and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. And before we begin tonight's meeting, I'd like to read a statement about the work uh, occurring in the district rega regarding the coronavirus. We understand the growing concern about coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, in our community. The district is closely monitoring this developing situation and continues to work directly with Johnson County Public Health and the Iowa Department of Public Health. The district has been regularly communicating updates with families and staff as information becomes available. As a district, we are operating in a state of preparedness. We are currently focusing on the areas of facilities and custodial services, nutrition services, and transportation to minimize the potential exposure of the virus within our schools. We are also focusing on preparing an online learning option should the need arise for schools to close. Let me assure you that a such a decision will not be made lightly and the district will seek specific guidance from Johnson County Public Health and the Iowa Department of Public Health before making any decisions regarding closing schools. As of now, the COVID-19 cases in Johnson County have not significantly impacted teaching and learning in our schools. We will continue to follow the guidance from the local and state health departments and provide regular updates to families and staff. Uh, we'll, with that, we'll move into our agenda for the evening. Um, first up, we have our student representatives. We'll start with Mira from City High. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for having me back again, and I hope all of you are having a nice afternoon. It's really lovely out, which we really appreciate at City. We're looking forward to being able to eat outside again. That's our big thing, eating lunch outside. Um, so. I'll start off with some really exciting news from just yesterday. The mock trial team took four, the mock trial program took four teams to regionals and ended up coming away with three teams qualifying for state. Our sophomore and senior teams both went undefeated, won both of their rounds, and our junior team got one of the highest number of points at the tournament despite losing one of their rounds, so they are also advancing to state. We're immensely proud of all three of our teams and they all put in such hard work, so we really appreciate that. Ellis Chen and Simon Weiss, two of the top policy debaters now in the country, won the state policy debate tournament on Saturday. We're so proud of them. They've had a wonderful senior career this year, and we're very excited to see what else they get up to. Jazz Ensemble won the SEBA uh, Southeast Iowa Band Association, I believe, jazz competition um, at West this past weekend, I think. And that's a really big accomplishment for them. Our bands have been working hard all year. And I know a lot of people in band who have been really, really dedicated. So really appreciate their work. Nina Levesos-Takopoulos, who's actually my co-executive editor on The Little Hawk, once runner-up for Journalist of the Year in Iowa this year. It's a really huge accomplishment. There are many, many students from across Iowa who apply for that honor. And it involves creating a portfolio and essays. So great work to her. Show Choir had their final performance of the year this weekend, the spring show. It was a wonderful celebration of Show Choir and a lot of the seniors last time, and so it was wonderful and emotional for them, I'm sure. Mr. Bacon wanted me to tell you about something that he and the staff is very proud of. So this year, Mr. Bacon encouraged teachers to mentor individually with students who had failed more than one of their classes first trimester. We had 50 students mentored by 65 teachers. And of those 50, 30 of them passed all of their classes second trimester and nine failed only one class. So we saw an immense amount of improvement for those students with the mentorship of teachers. So that was a really wonderful idea and program that was implemented. Moving on to our sports section of the evening, um, members of the boys' swim team won state championships and set stake records at the state tournament last month. Ben Keeter became a state boys' wrestling champion. He's only an underclassman at City now, so it's an amazing accomplishment for him. The girls' basketball team advanced to the state semifinals, and all students at City were anxiously watching them last week, and they did a wonderful job, so we're very proud of them. And uh, finally, I have an issue or a comment that I'd like to bring up to the board. 
Recently, Student Senate has been brainstorming ways we would like to think of to make city more eco-friendly, and we've communicated many of these ideas to the AmeriCorps, vol AmeriCorps volunteers who come to our school and are so wonderful to take our ideas, work with us, take our comments, and they've been absolutely amazing. But one idea that I'd like to speak to the board about is that City High doesn't always have adequate bike parking. So we have not very many bike racks and they're sometimes a little bit inaccessible to students. And additionally, a lot of them are out in the open. Um, there aren't any sheltered ones, so it can be difficult for students to park their bikes on days when they think it'll rain or there might be inclement weather. So one of our ideas was possibly to add more bike racks or to cover some of them so that students feel more open to using, to bring their bikes to school and just so, so that more students can park bikes at school because it's important to it, it's important to encourage different types of transportation to school. Now with Tate uh, relocating soon, we are hoping to have access to the bike racks that are currently at the old Hoover building. Um, but we are also always open to having more just because we've had some parking issues and so we really want to encourage students to be biking and walking to school. I think that's all I have for you tonight, but thank you so much and I look forward to speaking to you again next month. Mira, I have some questions. Yes, of course. Uh, to, to circle back to mock trial, Oh, yes. I'm happy to answer um, any questions about the mock trial program. Yes. Um, has City ever had three teams qualify for state in the same year? You know, Director Williams, I think not. I think have, this might be the first time. Have they ever had two teams qualify? I, I can't say for certain, but I think no, not and, at all. And how many teams total go to state? From regionals? You want to, how, at the state competition, are there, there are 32 teams? Yes, very, very few teams. I think some, some factor of two, so yes, probably 32, yes. So wait, so City's going to have 10% of the total teams competing at the state tournament? One could say that, Director wow. Williams. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's an be adequate really calculation to make. Yes, team. it's a really wonderful accomplishment. That's all so. I wanted. I Thank you, appreciate that. Everyone have a good evening. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mira. Uh, next up, Edity from West Hyde. Um, hello, good evening everyone. Um, I'm Aditi Borde, a junior at West High, and after months of preparation, West High's FRC robotics team attended the Super Regionals um, last week and ranked seventh out of over, 30 over, over 60 teams. Um, they were undefeated in their elimination matches, and this victory led them to qualify for Worlds this April. And this is the second time in three years that West's FRC robotics team has made it to the World Championships. So we wish them well, and this comes after months of preparation, as this is one of their, um, they only have a few select big competitions. So we're very proud of them. Um, now West High's other robotics team, FTC Robotics, also finished their season um, very strongly at, state ro at their state robotics champ championship um, past month. Of the top 48 teams in the state, they won the Promote Award, which is given to a team that really inspires and creates a video encouraging STEM into the community as well as in their school. Um, two of West High's jazz bands, Jazz Ensemble and their Symphonic Jazz Band, placed second place at the SEBA Jazz Festival this past weekend, and junior um, Ethan Buck was named the outstanding soloist in the 3A class division. Additionally, um, previous weekend, West High's Jazz Ensemble competed at the 35th Rolling Meadows High School Jazz Competition in Chicago, where various schools all over the country um, of different sizes came to compete. And of these schools, West High was named the overall grand championship, outplaying all of the other schools. Additionally, at this competition, Ethan Buck was named outstanding soloist as well um, for alto saxophone. Um, last Saturday, West High scientists also competed in the Iowa Science Olympiad. West won first place in over four different categories and second place in fifth. Um, West High's speech and debate team also attended the IFL turn at state championship last weekend. West High coach John Cooper was named um, speech and debate coach of the year and Ethan D'Alessandro was named East Iowa senior of the year. Despite West having a relatively small speech and debate team, they still placed fifth in the speech sweepstakes category. So we're obviously very proud of them because speech and debate is very rigorous and intensive and so we know it comes with a lot of hard work. Um, West High, West Side Story, West Side's West High's student-led news publication was named Snow Distinguished Site for the fourth year in a row, and they're one of the only two schools from Iowa to achieve this award. Additionally, Natalie Dunlap, West Side Story's online, online editor-in-chief, was named the 2020 Iowa High School Journalist of the Year, and this award was chosen by the Iowa National School and Press Association and the Iowa Newspaper Foundation, um, looking for students with qualities of leadership and hard work, and um, knowing Natalie personally, she's very hardworking, and this award was completely well-deserved. Um, along with 
the honor and the scholarship, Natalie is also not eligible for the National Journalist of the Year Award. Um, sophomores Shreya Kuller and Car Caroline Mas Mascardo created an award-winning video for the Environmental Protection Agency contest um, that was chosen out of the entire Midwest region. And by winning this award, they also won over, um, they won $6,000 too. Um, similarly, junior Deja Taylor impressed judges at the Iowa Science and Humanities Symposium with her original research titled, A Novel Suture Add Additive, Use of Beet Extract to Assess for Surgical Wound Infections. Um, Deja's project was, only, was one of only 15 selected as a finalist, and additionally, she won $2,000 and the opportunity to compete at the national level. Um, West High's BPA team also crowned 17 state champions at the state um, at state last month and advanced 24 to the national competition um, in Washington, D.C. Two students from West were also elected as state president and as a member of the six member state officer team, respectively. Um, in sports news, the boys basketball team qualified for state for the 10th consecutive year. This is a feat that no other Iowa high school team has accomplished before and they will be playing at state this Wednesday. Additionally, West High Boys Wrestling sent three wrestlers to the state finals and came back with three, with three state championships. Senior Will Hoft, Junior Graham Gambrell, and Sophomore Hunter Garvin all won in their respective categories. West um, Boys Swim Team also, complete, also completed an undefeated season and brought home the state swimming championship last month. Um, coming up, we have the blood drive this week, as well as um, some international spring, spring trips, which unfortunately may be canceled due to the coronavirus, but that's all I have for you today. So thank you, and thank I'll you. see you in April. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Liberty High, Brian. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ryan Iso, and I am a junior at Liberty. Um, we have done many amazing things in the past month that I am really happy to talk to you, talk to you about today. On March 1st, um, the Liberty Difference Makers hosted their um, Dance for a Difference Dance Marathon. The event ran from noon to six and included many different activities such as lip sync battles, um, silent auctions, and speeches from those who are battling or have battled life-threatening diseases and other fun activities. The dancers raised $61,762.22 this year, making this the most money that they have raised to date. Um, the BPA team um, went to state and got very high honors. Two Liberty students, Farhan Rostogi and Eric Colony, became elected state officials and a number of Liberty students are headed to nationals in DC this May. Student Senate is currently in the works of creating a club fair for students at Liberty to get more involved. Um, those dates are still being worked out with administration but are hoping to be within the next month or so. We are also planning on a de-stress week, the week before or after prom due to AP testing to encourage students to achieve academic success while being mindful about their mental health. On the 15th of February, Liberty Show Choir students made history. Impact, the girls prep group got first place in their prep division, and Storm got first place best vocals, best solos, and the grand champion overall at the competition. It was a great way to end the competitive season, and the 22nd was our annual spring showcase where Liberty Jazz and Show Choir's students made one last debut. There are also some teasers from the students in the Spring Musical Shrek, and many of those students are excited to put on Shrek, from what I've heard from the students in it. Um, the performance will be super funny and very well done. Dates for the show are April 2nd through the 4th. State-related news um, is that a number of speech students will be going to state this weekend, and the Science Olympiad team just recently competed at state last weekend, getting 12th out of 21 groups, meddling in three different events, forensics, astronomy, and anatomy and students are very excited for spring break and the many activities that will follow. That Thank you, have Thanks. a nice night. Um, next up, uh, Valerie from Tate High. We're experimenting with multimedia this month. I'm Valerie, I'm a senior at Tate High School. Um, this trimester, we once again welcome new students to Tate. We have 22 new students, most of whom transferred from other schools in the district. We hold orientation for new students every trimester and consider it a high priority to help them feel welcome in our building. It seems the new students are already feeling comfortable and find Tate to be a great fit. We've begun packing our library, offices, and classrooms to return to Mall Drive after spring break. The library will be moved starting tomorrow, and the staff will begin moving their classroom items on Thursday and Friday. We are all really looking forward to being back in our newly renovated building with lots of light. Our, 
We held our school-wide Poetry Out Loud competition on Tuesday, February 18th in the Tate Library. Poetry Out Loud is a nationwide poetry recitation competition sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts and open to students grades 9 through 12. We had three official competitors, six other students who performed original poetry for a crowd of about 50 Tate students and staff. It was so outstanding to see the students put themselves out there and perform for their peers. This year's Poetry Out Loud winner was Tate from, was, from Tate was Jay Walrich. Jay went on to the statewide competition in Des Moines this past Sunday to compete against 15 other state finalists and was awarded third place. Jay's performance was inspiring and they represented Tate well. We are so proud of Jay and to all the students who competed in our second annual Poetry Out Loud competition. I was there, they were amazing. <laughs> Iowa City Masonic Lodge No. 4 has chosen Tate English teacher Kate Ritchie as Masonic Teacher of the Year. This will be celebrated with a ceremony on April 26. Ms. Ritchie is now eligible to be Iowa Masonic Teacher of the Year with an application she will submit. Congratulations, Ms. Ritchie. The Hancher Guild Youth Art Show, now on display through March 28. Art created by 13 Tate students was selected for display in this show. Students have an opportunity to see their work on display in a formal setting and to attend a public opening for the community. This year, several Tate students attended the reception on February 20th with family and friends, and the students took great pride in the work they displayed. We will encourage you to stop by Hancher to see art created by students from across the district. Emily Spencer from the University of Iowa is visiting Tate once a month to work with Mr. Coffrin's PE and Ms. Halverson's health classes. Circle group discussions as well as writing activities have allowed students to self-reflect and receive wellness for curriculum. Students have received information and reflect on New Year's resolutions and tensions behind them, wellness, stress, trauma, self-care, and coping mechanisms. We have a diverse background of learners at Tate and having Emily provide these sessions has been a great avenue for our students to get engaged in writing and their overall wellness. Thank you, see you next month. Thank you, Valerie, appreciate it. Uh, next up we have Brady from ICEA. Uh, hi, uh, President Godwin, Vice President Isone, Director, Superintendent Murley. Uh, I'd like to just do a quick follow-up to the update that was provided on the coronavirus uh, COVID-19. You know, clearly this is a dynamic uh, situation, and I know just from um, in our, my involvement that there's been daily work and consultation with the Johnson County Public Health Department as well as the Iowa Department of Public Health uh, by the teams you see here. ICEA input has been sought and received and heard. And um, within the fluid context that we're facing, the district team really has sought to provide careful and reasoned guidance developed in consultation with the uh, community agencies. And um, you know, I'd like to say you know, just a special thanks to all of the folks who were here from the district administrative team. So Steve, uh, Matt, Amy, Chase, Nick, Kristen, Lisa, Adam, Kate, Dwayne, Les, uh, and Janet and their respective teams. I just really appreciate the work that they've done. I've been around the building enough and have been in the meetings enough to know that it's incredibly challenging work. It's a, um, and I'd just like to give a special thanks too to Steve and uh, Matt came up on Sunday afternoon to Liberty. We had world language trips. We were trying to figure out what to do. And I can just tell you from the perspective of the teachers to have uh, Matt and Steve both there to help the teachers feel supported was incredibly helpful. So, uh, you know, thanks to everyone in the district for their work on this and if that will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. Appreciate those comments. Um, we'll move to agenda approval. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I skipped community comment. My, my, uh, my bad. I apologize. Community comment. First up, we have James Lynch, uh, followed by Brenda Lindley. Hello, my name is uh, Jim Lynch, and I live at 9 Chad Court, Coralville. And the topic I'm addressing is para, para educator pay scale. I am a special education para educator at Coralville Central Elementary School, and I've been at this school for 15 years. I also brought a couple of my other special para educators that work at our school as support. Um, I'm here today to voice the concern that the pay scale for para educators in our book in our negotiated agreement booklet has not changed in at least 15 years. I have recently spoken to Superintendent Steve Murley about this exact topic. I'm still, not I'm still unsure if paraeducators are in a union and who represents us. Our behavior modification coordinator recently told us 
that we have the most difficult job in the district. I agree with this. The problem is we get paid the least. Many of us have college degrees and social services experiences. Single income pair educators, educators have to work other jobs in addition to their full-time job, pair jobs, just to make it, make ends meet in, in Johnson County. I and other pair educators, some who have joined me here tonight, don't think that this is fair. We have very demanding and stressful jobs. We are expected to follow strict schedules and be professional at all times. Yet year after year, we see teachers get pay increases and we get little or none. The last pay raise I got was three or four years ago and it was six, a six cents an hour raise. And to me, that's ridiculous. Many of us are required to put ourselves in harm's way each and every single day. We go to work. We've been bitten, scratched, punched, kicked, yelled at, and sworn at. What other occupation faces these challenges? The only one I can think of is police personnel, and they are paid yearly salaries, not hourly wages. Most people don't know what paraeducators do. Our jobs are varied and many. We work one-on-one -on -one with special needs students. We monitor recess grounds where, where bullying and fighting can and does happen. We work in the lunchroom assisting students. Most importantly, many of us are the Many of us are the consistent person a student or students look to to make it through their day. We build relationships of trust with these students so that they can know that they can rely on us when they cannot cope with the situation. Our schedules can change multiple times during the school year, depending on need. We adapt to all these changes and challenges every single year. I know our schools cannot run without teachers, and they are incredible but they can't function without paraeducators edu either. We are also pretty incredible. Ask any teacher what they would do if they had no support staff to help them. We are their support staff, but where is our support? I and many of us feel that no one is actually negotiating for us, for our pay to increase, only for the teachers year after year. We feel not only that we aren't getting scraps after the teachers are taken care of, but by the time we get to the table, there is absolutely nothing left for us, and, or that we are not even invited to the, to the negotiating table. Again, our behavior modification coordinator told us that he feels we should be making at least $20 an hour for the demanding job that we do. I feel it is way past time that this is not just talked about, but something is done starting this year at negotiations to give pair educators a substantial raise in pay. So now, the ball is in your court. Show us what you think of us. Are we valuable and crucial members of the school district? I guess we'll find out after the upcoming negotiations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate your remarks tonight. How long have you been a para? I've been a para educator for 15 years. Okay, thank you, and thanks for your comment. Brenda Lindley, followed by Eric Creech. Hello. I'm going to just let it work. I want to thank the board and the administration for its commitment to reviewing the climate at Lucas Elementary following the turnover of four principals in the last nine years, the most recent being a black woman who experienced strong resistance to her leadership. I have three kids at Lucas Elementary and it is a great school. And like all schools, it is not without problems. Our parents, teachers, and administrators grew up in a world that influence us, influences us still today, sometimes without us even realizing it. Fewer than 15 years ago, there was a state that still had laws limiting the number of African Americans they could hire as supervisors in the schools. And as, as again, as recently as 15 years ago, there were states that allowed uh, teachers who worked in segregated private schools to receive public pensions. We are not post-racial. We are not colorblind. It is hard. Having conversations about our own implicit bias is hard. No one wants to think they are biased. However, what a gift we have. Lucas Elementary can shine a light in the dark places that exist in this district. Lucas Elementary can start the difficult conversations in looking at implicit bias and how it informs decisions we make with our students, our parents, our teachers, and our administrators. 
The state of Iowa has a long and storied history of progressiveness. The first state to elect a woman to public office. The first mosque in the U.S. was built in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The second state to legalize interracial marriage. This was in 1851. The second state to outlaw segregated schools. This is in 1868. This is the state of Iowa. And the second state to legalize same-sex marriage. We can continue setting standards and showing the world we are more than a flyover state. We are more than a caucus debacle. Say that 10 times fast. If we continue to put our heads in the sand and pretend our biases don't exist, we are damaging our students, our parents, our teachers, our and our administrators. And it is damaging to us. I am dangerous if I don't examine my words and actions through my lens of privilege. We have to get uncomfortable. We have to have these difficult conversations and admit that we exist in a world that views some as other. We exist in a world that is set up as a zero-sum game for some of us, and we have an opportunity to change that. Lucas Elementary has the opportunity to stand up and say, yes, we have implicit bias. Yes, we have made mistakes. We will continue to make mistakes, and we are willing to do the work to change the system. We are willing to be uncomfortable because we know there are people among us who live in discomfort on the daily. And if we can be uncomfortable for an hour, a week, a month, or a year so that the othered in our lives can live more comfortably, then we proudly and gladly accept the responsibility to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Eric Creech, followed by Angel Taylor. Hi, um, so I appreciate the speakers prior to me. They're very eloquent. I probably won't be able to live up to that standard, but I want to talk about mental health again and what the district can do to assist this community in the school district with both teachers and students. I know something that would be helpful is more paras being paid more probably as well that would be really helpful for everyone and i know also that i'm requesting the board during this time of regime change to re-evaluate the most recent non-disclosure agreements that have been given to teachers forced into retirement and all terminations under the current regime. The superintendent's on his way out. The HR has a new position. This seems like a very good time to reevaluate what I call a systematic, administrative, bureaucratic form of bullying. There's been a lot going around about how to stop bullying in the classrooms. The gentleman spoke of it. In a way, it's not really ever going to go away. We need to be vigilant. But we let it slide with certain classes of people, and we let it slide with certain ethnicities to target children who don't quite fit in in different ways, whatever it is, and sometimes it's mental health reasons. That has to stop. What also has to stop is allowing principals and human resources to push teachers out at weak moments or because of payroll concerns and not giving them adequate support that they deserve. I think that if you review your records, you'll see that teachers will tell you they're afraid to come forward for anything. They do not want to become the next target. This fine gentleman who came up here and spoke about his own wage and spoke for his coworkers is very honorable. He's a strong person. Not everyone has that strength, but the school board has to be equitable and they need to consider what their actions are doing to the community they serve. 
Some of the actions taken by this administration are destroying families, not assisting them, not educating their children, not giving them opportunities. They're being brushed aside sometimes, both students and teachers. They're being swept under the carpet. Something has to be done about it. It's the perfect time. It's a perfect time to put, make it a goal. It's a perfect time to reevaluate all the little tricky things that go on that make it impossible for people to be heard. It's a perfect time to reevaluate our commitment to the community and our teachers. Thank you, Eric. Angel Taylor, followed by Noor Miller. Angel Taylor, um, speaking on behalf of the Black Voices Project. Um, so we just have a message for you guys, all right? Um, the Black Voices Project is pleased to see progress on our request uh, as of January 28th to hire an external reviewer to access the climate at Lucas Elementary. We understand that the reviewer has begun her work as of this week. We want to reiterate the importance of including a range of people in her interviews, including our members. We also think it would be advisable to include delegates from the Black Voices Project team among the team charged with the decision making with regard to that review. Given the concerns raised at the board table about the cost of the contract and potential additional fees for travel and related expenses, we want to ensure that the review is not hampered by too narrow a scope. It must be inclusive, inclusive of members of the community who are knowledgeable about ongoing racial microaggressions and the systemic injustice. We expect that the board will direct the superintendent and staff to ensure that the external reviewer meets with current and former staff, including the student family advocates, Black Voices Project leadership, current and former parents, and former Lucas teachers who are still in the district. Um, we can direct you to parents who have brought their concerns to us. We are also aware of students who can speak to their experience of racial inequity, but we recognize that it may be difficult to arrange a proper setting for the children to participate. In addition, we, as stated in our January message, while Lucas may currently be the most acute example, it is by no means alone. We expect that the Lucas review will be the beginning, not the end, of our reckoning with racism. The board will need to establish clear, clear policies and expectations on how district leaders and staff should address complaints about climate in schools and hold them accountable. You also must ensure that all future board members are, brief, are fully briefed as part of their onboarding and onboarding training. Systemic racism is at work in every corner of our society and we would be fools to think it is not a factor in our schools. We could give you a long list of examples of past and current injustices, inconsistent disciplinary practices and uneven playing fields in hiring. But what we really want is for you to set policies and then enforce them so that this list stop, stops growing. Hold yourselves accountable. Hold your employees accountable. I promise you, if you don't, we will. And that's all I have. Thank you, Angel. Thank you. Noor Miller, followed by Laura Ebinger. Hi, my name is Nora Miller. I'm a parent of two students at Borlaug Elementary. All these ladies behind me are also parents of students at Borlaug. I have a third grader and a first grader. We love Borlaug. We're very proud of our uh, student population, our teachers, our administrators. We're here today on behalf of everybody at Borlaug um, to discuss RAM. Um, currently, we're placed in the five-tier model and we are in the fifth tier, um, partnered with schools that have completely different demographics than we have. Um, we saw that the board had recently put out three different projections of what a snapshot would look like if we moved down one level. Um, with universal kindergarten capped at 21 kids per class. Um, we had some time to look at those uh, three models and kind of see how that would work for our school. 
Um, just to give everybody a little idea, our free and reduced lunch numbers increased from last year to this year. They went from 36.8% to 416 our special ed population nearly doubled from 5.5% to 11.9. We hold an ELL um, rate of about 20% um, with our FRL increasing over 40%. We're now a Title I school. From last year to this year, um, our para staff numbers went up by 11 pa extra paras this year from um, the year before. Um, I understand it was hard to predict how this was all going to play out, being that we were making budget cuts along with changing boundaries. Um, and um, so we're just here to tell you how that feels. This model uh, feels like it's imposing a lot of stress on our students. It's not optimizing learning. Um, so just to give you an example, prior to January, we only had two kindergarten sections. Each had 28 kids. We appreciate the addition of a third section. Um, the teachers are, were very appreciative of that. It's made for a much better learning environment for those kindergarten students, much of who this is their first experience with school in general. Um, we currently only have two third grade sections. Each section has 31 and 32 students. That's always changing because our enrollment, we are a school that is constantly enrolling students throughout the year. I think last year we enrolled nine more students in the spring. Um, so we've been over the RAM numbers or the RAM um, allocations for those classes the entire year and it's evident there's no room in the school in the room um, we have a lot of kids in that class that are in the title one program about five kids in the class are in the ell program it makes for a really difficult teaching and learning environment our fifth grade also only has two sections um, and they each have 31 students um, so we're happy to see that um, you're looking at the RAM. And I mean, even just based on our current numbers, we would be moved up a level in this current um, model, but it doesn't do much for our class size. Um, so we're hoping with I know the enrollment report hasn't come out yet and we haven't figured out what money we're getting from the state because they haven't come back to us with their numbers. Um, but we're hoping that since we're not making these big budget cuts this year and that our enrollment has gone up by 287 kids, that gives the district more money per pupil and that that money will go to being able to make these changes in our class sizes. Um, Thank you, Noor. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. Um, move on to Laura Ebinger. Hi, I'm Laura Ebinger, and um, I'm an attorney at Kids First Law Center. I'm also a parent of a first and third grader at Borlaug Elementary, and I volunteer um, several hours every week at Borlaug. Um, why I'm here is um, is a follow up. I'm, I'm here out of really serious concern to say. These classrooms at Borlaug are not working for our kids right now. Um, the classroom size um, and the student need um, means that uh, we're just we can do better. And I know I know you are all committed to um, to that. So um, I just wanted to give you some examples. This year, my daughter's third grade class has um, has gone between 31 and 32 students um, in that third grade classroom. Despite having a new facility, despite having an empty classroom next door, we have 32 kids squeezed into this small classroom. They don't have enough cubbies. They have nowhere to hang their coats when they come in the day, uh, for the day. We're, we're tasked with challenging students through this rigorous and creative curriculum. They don't have any space to be able to get creative. They don't have space to move. I think it's impossible when, like, when there's physically not enough space to, for a teacher to move about the classroom. She can't walk between the desks. Um, I don't know how we expect her to, our teachers to meet students' individual learning needs. When, when they can't even see what the kids are working on or be able to reach them. Um, the, the veteran teacher um, in my daughter's classroom, um, is she's, she's great and she's doing the best she can. Um, she's pulling out kids you know, every day for, um, for independence 
or during this independent study time, kids who have um, you know small group reading needs, but 28 other kids are fending for themselves during that time um, that we call independent study. Um, she's asked parents, grandparents, anyone who's able, hoping to get you know more para support to be able to just come into the classroom and um, and help restore some order. During that time, I've personally witnessed bullying, I've witnessed stealing, including kids stealing, um, stealing the teacher's keys, um, destroying property. Um, they're, they're telling us in so many ways, we need, we need people, we need more during this time, and instead we're just leaving them and, um, to, to try and independently study during this time and figure things out on their own. And our teachers are, are saying, we're desperate for help. Um, and uh, and really, it's the it's up to you guys to um, help them get them the support they need. Um, I think we we've, we've kind of tasked them with absorbing these higher numbers and higher student needs, but we haven't set them up for success. Um, I think you know when we show kids from the moment they walk in the door to throw their coat in a milk crate, we've shown them that we're not ready to meet your needs from the from the moment you step in. Um, I think we can do better, I think we should do better, our kids deserve it, and I think a step in the right direction is reducing classroom size. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to everyone who's come tonight to express your views and, and advocate for your causes. I think this is an important part of our dialogue in the district. It's only going to help us get better, so thank you all again for coming tonight. I appreciate it very much. Um, next, we will go to our agenda approval uh, of the evening. Is there a motion to approve our agenda? So move. Second. Okay, I'm ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you, Kim. Consent agenda. Um, who reviewed bills this period? Any comments? Uh, the only comment I have is that it was a very small pile of bills this time around and I was very appreciative because the last <laughs> time I did it was right after winter break and it was like 20 giant piles and it took forever so it was actually really short and the only other one, thing that stood out to me was that apparently James Bond does something for us because we were giving money to Daniel Craig but I think he was a, a referee a of some sort. Different so. Daniel Craig I'm guessing. I don't think it was yes. actually James Bond but there, <laughs> there uh, didn't appear to be anything out of order and I didn't didn't end up having any questions for anyone. Okay, great. I don't Thanks. know who else. I think Ruthina did it as well. I didn't see any questions from her either, so thank you for doing that. Um, are there any items directors would like to pull from consent agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve consent agenda? So, second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. It's not working. Sure it is. It is. <laughs> Let me close it and open it again. I thought it was just, just me. Oh. Did you get it? There it is. There we go. There we go. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Steve, we're going to talk about annual enrollment and demographic update. We are. So, uh, you know, we've been uh, anxiously awaiting the uh, DE's update of their documents. So there's a couple things that I will share with you tonight. Uh, we're not going to go through all of these, but I just want to draw your attention to some of the numbers that are in there. I know in particular there's a question about changes in uh, S uh, FRL status, SES status at our schools following the rezoning. So we'll take a look at that after we uh, run through the deck real quick. Again, I'm not going to touch on all of them, but uh, just a couple things to note. Uh, if you look at uh, page four on your deck, you'll notice that uh, we've got uh, some uh, summary numbers for enrollment changes over the last uh, 20 years. Um, you notice we're up uh, almost uh, 4,000 kids. Um, and as one of the speakers mentioned earlier, we're up 287 kids uh, last year. If you look at the trend line, obviously uh, going up fairly substantially, only one year in the last 20 that we've seen an enrollment decline uh, in the district. Uh, race and ethnicity, I'll just pause on this slide for a moment. I think uh, if you look over the last 20 years, you can see uh, a fairly significant change in the makeup of the students in our classroom uh, and uh, a pretty substantial uh, difference in uh, the number of uh, students in particular that identify as uh, multiracial. Notice that that category really comes into play in 2011-12 um, and we see a pretty substantial increase 
uh, in students in that uh, particular category as we move through 2019-20. I uh, drop down to our FRL students, uh, and I just draw your attention to the significant change in students that qualify for free and reduced lunch in the district. So uh, just a minute ago, we talked about adding almost 4,000 kids in the district in the last 20 years. Um, if you look at that, uh, almost 3,500 kids uh, in the last 20 years qualified for free and reduced lunch. So if you think of the change of our district over the last 20 years, uh, uh, either a majority of the kids that we added or kids that lived in the district, um, that population is almost exclusively students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, so obviously that's a substantial change. We had a little bit smaller uh, change last year uh, than the year before. You can see that that number has been up and down um, over the course of the past few years, and some of that has to deal with the stabil stability and mobility issues that we have uh, inside and between our districts. Steve, is that yeah. by eligible, is that only folks who filled out applications that or is only part? only uh, parents uh, and children that have filled out the applications so. uh, and then uh, this is our uh, percentage of kids um, and you can see that uh, the increase in students the percentage of students that qualify is up 20 percent uh, in the last 20 years 7 percent uh, in the last 10 years so a substantial change in the percentage of our overall population um, that has qualified for free and reduced lunch eligibility We've also seen an enormous change in ELL. I'm gonna pause just a moment on this slide to note that um, there have been some changes in how the state uh, um, accounts for students that are eligible for English language learning instruction. So you can see a couple of substantial changes here uh, as you look at uh, 2005, six to six, seven, uh, and then again, 12, 13 to 13, 14, and that had to do with changes in the state's uh, guidelines for students that are eligible for English language learning. Again, when you look at those numbers, uh, a pretty substantial uh, change in our population over the last 20 years, almost 1,600 students. Um, just last year we grew 76 students. Again, you look at that trend line there. Um, and uh, I know one of the things that Kristen and I frequently speak about when we talk about the district as a whole is that we have over 90 languages um, spoken in the district. Um, not unusual for a metropolitan uh, school district, but perhaps unusual for a district our size. Uh, the percentage of kids that qualify, again, a pretty substantial increase there, 10% uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, almost 9% in the last decade. Um, special education, I'm gonna stop here for just a moment, draw your attention to the fact the numbers only go back to seven, eight. Um, as Lisa and I have talked about, uh, over time the state has changed their definitions and how they count students. So from a uh, public statistical database, they only go back to 2007. Um, we were able to gather numbers going back further, but because of definitional changes, um, those numbers don't align with the way that they count kids now. Um, so we elected to take those numbers that they have publicly available uh, and use those as part of our data set. Um, you'll notice uh, uh, over the course of that uh, period from 2007-8 to today uh, that we're on a downward trajectory in terms of the number of students. When you look at the numbers overall uh, and you look at them over that, that uh, period of time, um, down 144 students. Again, reflect back on the fact that we're up uh, in that last decade, uh, almost 2,000 kids. Uh, and so what you see when you drop down here to percentage um, is that uh, each one of those, oops, that's supposed to be a 12 year change there. Um, each one of these changes uh, uh, shows a uh, decline uh, since from 2007, eight to today. So um, if you look at seven, eight to today, that's three and a half percent. And then nine, 10 to today, two, nine. Uh, so uh, we've seen a decline in the percentage of our children that qualify for special education assistance. So that was just a quick walk through it. Stop and see if you have questions on that before we go take a look at our FRL by school. Uh, well, <clears throat> I just want to make a comment actually to the board, I think, uh, as much as anyone. Uh, we've had some conversations so far this year about avoiding deficit uh, concepts and uh, language and we're, when we're talking about uh, the uh, students in the district. And I think there's, uh, I know I t tend to see myself to look at FRL numbers and I'm thinking and, and other numbers here. And I think about deficits, and I'm trying to steal myself or to learn myself away from doing that. And I suspect all of us are doing that as well. As well. So, in looking at these numbers, I think we need to look at you know, and these numbers are as much about opportunities as they are uh, uh, to challenges. Absolutely, especially with that ELL issue. You know, we talk about those 90 languages, and I was just talking to some parents about um, participating in the United Nations Night at uh, Weber Elementary School. Uh, and, and what a gift that is for uh, the students that don't speak a world language to be able to, to learn and participate from that at an early age. 
And then uh, there was a question about how our uh, uh, schools look today, um, and in particular uh, as it relates to the changes in our attendance areas uh, at the start of this school year. Um, so I guess I would draw your attention in particular to this change between 2018 and 2019-20. Um, we have several attendance areas that have fairly dramatic uh, uh, changes in their numbers. Uh, probably one that uh, stands out is if you drop down here to Twain Elementary School, which you see last year, um, almost 80% of the students uh, uh, qualified for free and reduced lunch. And this year that number is approximately 56.1. Um, so we see a better balance. So uh, as, we, as we look at uh, trying to ensure that educational opportunities uh, are equivalent, uh, uh, attendance area to attendance area, zip code to zip code, uh, I think that uh, that shows some of the work that the board set out to accomplish as they went through that process last year. And I also see here that there are more schools with, uh, who have an average of uh, FRL eligible students that's close to the district average. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And that was a big part of the goal that we had. Mm -hmm. Questions on the numbers? Questions. I actually was happy to see the this chart that you have displaying. I mean, it was a very difficult, hard process going through the boundary work um, and then also the budget uh, activity. And I, I do know that it was a disruptive year uh, given both of those changes, and we've heard about that tonight. Um, but, but it was heartening for me to see that the hard work we put into the boundary work, it actually is reflected in some of these. Uh, numbers at school, so it's a it's a it's one step. Um, it's not the only step. We still have a lot of a lot of work to do to create more opportunities for all of our students. But this is a, a good step. Right. Yep. Just a reminder too, we had some uh, uh, opportunity for students to grandfather, so we anticipate that as we move fully into the attendance zone uh, next year, uh, after those grandfathered students have moved on, that uh, we hope to see uh, some incremental growth in that uh, closure of the gap and and that regression to the mean process as we yep. come in next year. And are we still waiting on more reports from the state to finish up to? These were the numbers that we needed for this particular uh, data set. Um, they're still literally dropping things on a day-by-day -day basis. So I know it feels like a million years ago, but it was literally just yesterday morning that um, our ELL and our special education numbers were verified by the state and were released publicly. So we are still waiting on numbers. I know uh, Adam is here and we've, uh, we've talked about some of the challenges that the Department of Ed has had um, getting their data straightened out. So there are still some data sets that haven't been released yet. So what are we still waiting on? Uh, well, I'd have to go back and look specifically. I got a whole list of them. I, I, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the ones off the top of my head. I can give you a let list me, of Let those. me make it easy on you. Yeah. We do an annual enrollment report. Yes. Right? Uh, can, can we do two? Like when we get the rest of it? Yes, we can. That's As a matter of fact, we, 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 we don't have the, all the information yes. that we usually get during this yes. one time deal. So yeah. once we get all that, I would appreciate it. These numbers were relatively one. easy to update because they came in Monday and the, the report uh, here was already <coughs> formatted. We literally just had to drop them in. Um, so we've looked at, uh, and actually we're going to meet to uh, reconcile these numbers with that report, and we'll identify those data gaps that are out there so we know what's next. Yeah, I think one thing we could talk about, too, is I, I know we get some uh, conversation around, you know, the enrollment report and the size of it. And I think as we look at that second part is part of hearing of what's of value, right? I mean, we've talked about also trying to do either further projections or when we'll have those projections for certain attendance areas out. You know, there's, there's some of those data sets in there that are maybe useful when it's in a time of drawing boundaries or looking at the effect boundaries have, but there's also data sets in there that, you know, we, that generally don't create a lot of conversation or discussion points for us. And so I think Steve did a nice job there showing you those big chunks, and we'll talk class size chunks later, obviously, but then there's some other things in there that have just been in there year after year that, you know, if there's still value in those, of course we can pull those together, but if there's not a value or if there's something that's more valuable, we could look at as well. We're also working to better understand when the DE is going to do drop data in the future. We want to make sure that uh, we can reasonably predict for you when we can provide that information. And um, as we work with the state to determine their data gathering processes and their data release processes, if, if this is a report that we want to kick out to you in the fall, but they're not going to give us this information until March, um, then we'll have to revise how we do our, our presentations to you. So we're working on clarification. Is, that, is there indication that this is the norm now, or is it? <laughs> just an anomaly. We're Adam, six you want to offer some, one that, some feedback? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, the guidance we've gotten from the state is that this is an anomaly and they don't expect this to happen um, going forward. Uh, so that's my assumption. But coming. All right. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? 
Thank you, Steve. Um, next, we'll move into uh, discussion item on our care assessment update. Is that uh, Matt? Yeah, I can open it up. Um, I think the opportunity here was for you guys to have a little bit of conversation based on the presentations you heard from the two different groups around the social media monitoring uh, component or the, the kind of the G Suite monitoring component uh, that Gaglin securely talked about. And uh, so I've uploaded the two different presentations there uh, for you about what they um, kind of addressed with you that evening. And then the second part is probably just an update on that coordinator position. Uh, we've got between 20 to 30 applications uh, for that position and have begun trying to screen those and look through um, to see who would be qualified to bring in to talk to. I think for an interview format, of, uh, we know that we need to have important stakeholder groups at the table there, that that's not just an internal process, that we probably need some external stakeholders as well uh, to be meeting and, and greeting those people um, as we see if they're a good fit for the district. So we've already looked at job description, you know, components like that. So I think that's the best I can share with you about where we're on, at on that coordinator position. So we would anticipate those interviews starting to happen here sometime after spring break, early April uh, to do that. and then. Um, I would just open it up for conversation around the other piece and I'll try to address any questions you might have or even maybe take notes and see if we can get further clarification if there's some of those things. The sort of Q&A on that, can you just remind us um, why we're having the conversation with sure. Securely and Gaggle? It's kind of part of the grant process that we received, right? Right. So again, remember all this came from the Safety and Security Committee's recommendations about different things we could do to try to create the, uh, a safer school environment and that's where some of our care assessment team work has begun and then uh, with that care assessment team work, we applied for that COPS grant and were awarded the grant and then part of those funds were designated to trying to do an alert system of this nature, right? That if kids were a threat to harm themselves or to other people, uh, that we'd be able to flag that and then be able to try to intervene in a positive way. And so these were a couple of the, the companies that we were familiar with that could do that type of service. Uh, of course, we've had community conversation about what that is, what that means around data privacy, all of those different components, right? Um, and so I think that's, that's really how we landed here, is looking at the best approaches to try to keep our kids safe and, and try to be able to wrap supports around before we're you know, reacting to a situation. This would maybe give us a chance to respond and try to intervene in a positive way and, and learn about some you know, tragic events before they occur. Yep. One last question. Yep. Um, are we compelled by the grant to actually use funds for these, this kind of alert monitoring system? I mean, do we have to, to, as a provision for the grant, do we have to spend the money on this kind of monitoring? I think as with most grants, you know, it would be a plan change then if we weren't going to spend money on this because it's designated in our application that, you know, part of the funds would go to this just like part of the funds would go to the hiring the okay. position. So if we were going to divert those funds somewhere else, we'd probably have to work through a process and do something different. I just, I just want a yep. little playing field in terms of what we're talking about here. So comments, questions from directors on these two? And I think if I could just add, we'd, you know, ideally we'd like some direction from you about if we should pursue one of these further, or if you'd like us to hold off for that, you know, wherever we kind of leave the conversation tonight. I just to kind of helped me remember, there was a lot thrown at us that night from those two groups, but uh, if I'm remembering it right, it, we're sort of locked into their algorithms, for lack of a better word, onto what they're flagging and what they're going to tell us and that kind of stuff? Or do we have some sort of say, like, we only want to hear about X and Y or whatnot? Yeah, so we actually do have say in terms of what levels we would establish that we would require notification for. So their, their algorithm, and I should you know, make clear that I have not worked directly with either of the products under consideration, so I have no firsthand experience of how they work in practice. Um, but their algorithm will look at everything. We establish thresholds for what we'd be notified of. So for instance, um, Gaggle I know is capable of flagging profanity. We would probably not, and I don't want to speak for everybody here, but we probably would not require a notification or an alert for a flag of profanity, right? We're not interested in that. And so we should be able to establish those limits. My understanding from the presentation that I received from both companies is that they would both be capable of doing that on a category basis. So basically looking at categories and looking at severity in terms of how we would establish what we would be alerted about and how we would be alerted. Yeah, that was kind of my, cause I asked like one question at that and I was like, so if this happens, is you gonna, like what information is getting passed along and I, I, I had concerns that 
they were going to have this very strict flagging thing and send it all to us and then we're sort of compelled to act on things that we probably wouldn't have ordinarily and and it makes me feel better to know that we would have a little more control over that and be able to to set those limits because i think the intent behind it i think is a very good one right to find situations where you know kids are in crisis and we just don't know it i i I'm totally on board with that intent, but uh, opening it up, you know, without, you know, putting it in the box a little bit uh, scares me quite a bit. So that, that makes me feel better. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I was just going to say, if, uh, is there a timeline that you're looking for this matter? Is this something that um, maybe we could, after we hire our care assessment coordinator, like have, a, have them be brought up to date on the two and, and maybe a recommendation from which one they maybe prefer or... or yeah, we could do a couple different things. I think uh, by the time we get that person in place uh, could be one thing, but you know, potentially if they're in another position, we may not get to begin the work with that person as soon as we'd like. Um, if we could, ideally, yeah, we could get them up to speed on that. They could bring forward a recommendation based on what they're seeing or, or what their experience after reviewing those a little closer would be. We also administratively could dig in a little deeper and provide a recommendation back um, you know, to you around that. Um, I had one other point there. I think the, you know, the piece for us, we'd have that same concern too, Sean, you know, with that aspect is that we don't want the door too wide open and that we're involved in things that we don't want to be in. I think it's a, you know, pretty high level of things that we want to uh, set that bar at that, you know, these extreme situations to get into. Um, I think timeline wise, that's why I was trying to remember to come back to Paul was timeline wise, you know, for us, it would be great if this was operational at the start of the school year. You know, I think that's the thing for us, right? The care assessment coordinator we want to have in place prior to the summer so we can get plans ready to go so that those things are operational in the fall. Same thing with this. Any legwork we'd want to do, we'd want to have it operational and ready for August when students return and that we'd have that going by then. And in order, I bring that up because, I mean, I listened to both the presentations and I, you know, searched what I could on them. And I could probably flip a coin and pick one, but I'm not going to be the one day in and day out that's going to be working with this information. So I'd much rather prefer a recommendation, if you guys have a recommendation one way or another, on who you would prefer um, to work with to come from you guys just so we can take that into account because you guys are going to be the ones that day in and day out are dealing with it. Yeah, I would echo Paul. That was the, the walk away I had from that presentation is that there's very little difference between, and there are some differences in what they're monitoring and how it's going to work, but um, not enough to significantly make me feel strongly one over the other. And so I, I would want to defer to the people who are going to have the hands-on use with them about which platform you all thought was more user-friendly and, and better to work with. Yeah, I, I agree. I did have one slight, but again, this is very mildly informed based on that one presentation, but the model that, that Gaggle uses in terms of all the, the, the third party people they have to review these alerts and, and that just, I mean, I asked questions about it that night. I mean, I know what it's like to train, recruit, hire, quality manage, you know, remote workers and making sure they're staying on tune and, and I don't know, I just had this almost visceral reaction. I'd almost rather our own district staff getting those alerts and, and being able to make the calls uh, because we know the student better, we know the context better. And I know those folks are trained, I know they do a good job and I'm not at all being disparaging. It's just, um, that was just a part of the gaggle model that I questioned. Um, and, and so I sort of like securely a little bit better for that reason. That seemed to be more, uh, the securely model was to use AI to flag and then it would come to district staff to make those decisions. Just again, based on just that one presentation and whether that's relevant, I, I completely agree with Paul and Lisa. I'd like for y'all to take a look at what the implementation timeline looks like. How hard is this thing to adopt? How, what's the PD, how, what's the training required? I mean, there's an uplift in the district to actually get this going. Um, what's the easiest and best one for y'all? What are the price point differences? I don't think we got into that in the conversation. Um, that, that's the kind of support, what's the support model uh, when districts adopt one of these tools. There's a whole bunch of questions um, that y'all will be better prepared to dig into. Um, though uh, one last comment is just also around data security and privacy. Um, I know both companies talked about that and I just would want to make sure that we're very, very clear on, on how those, uh, how the data's being used or not used, how long it's retained, you know, from a privacy standpoint, what we're using. And I know we had some of that the other night too, but um, that for me would also be a factor uh, in the decision-making process if one was better at that than the other. Yeah, great. Jen, I'd echo what you said about the, the sort of army people and they said, they very vaguely said, 
oh, they're, it's, they're in sociology and psychology. Um, what does that mean? That was pretty, like, did they have an undergraduate degree in psychology and that qualifies them? So I was pretty skeptical about that. And I have read an article that said they pay those folks about 10 bucks an hour. Yeah. I'd be really skeptical of, you know, that you're going to hire a quality person to make that level decision. Um, on the privacy thing, certainly I thought I took some notes securely, mentioned a whole lot more um, California student privacy badge. I don't know what any of these things mean, but they seem to think it was like the gold standard. Um, and, and they talked about that quite a bit more. Um, uh, they were pretty explicit about not selling the info. They're running on the cloud, Amazon cloud. Uh, they'll retain the data until we say get rid of it. I thought that was, um, uh, so that just stood out to me. But again, the folks who are going to be working with it, what the price is, you know, I don't feel qualified to, to make that decision. Um, those were just the things that kind of stood out to me as I was listening to their presentations. Yeah, I, from what I've uh, gathered so far about comments that are coming to, to us, uh, people are going to be concerned about uh, student privacy and uh, what happens to the data, uh, who, who doesn't get it, and they're not, people are not making money off of students uh, and family data. And again, I'm not certainly not going to say that I'm qualified to make those assessments, but something I think I would like to read in your recommendations. So. And didn't, didn't securely... Right at the end, they said we had some, a month of tri trial data, or they said something about we had a month of. Correct. So they set up. So we actually, we, I had said I haven't used either product, which is accurate. We do, however, use Securely as a company for content filtering okay. within our domain. And because of that, the technology is actually already in place for the Securely solution. And they, they collected anonymized uh, trial data basically for one month to show what a report might look like. And it had been stripped of any student references or anything like that. Um, but it just showed what the report would look like, what our data would have looked like over the course of a month. So they collected that. Well, I know I'm, I'm not usually shy about having opinions. I'm, I'm going to say that uh, on this one, that staff recommendation is... is uh, going to be fine yeah. with, with me. So maybe an agenda study we can talk about when it would be the time for y'all to bring back a recommendation on that. Yeah, exactly. We could talk about bringing back a recommendation and if at that point you want us to bring back, you know, a contract or if you'd rather have the recommendation in the contract but staging that or Part of consent we agenda do it. and we pull yep. it and if we want to have a conversation. Right. That'd be do you guys know, are the prices relatively close? I think they're a little bit far apart, actually. Oh, okay. I think one's considerably more expensive than the other. Got it. Okay. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks, Matt, for uh, um, taking all the questions. Um, uh, and uh, any questions on the coordinator position before we move on to the next topic? I think I think Matt covered that. Um, I, I just want to uh, uh, mention that uh, Mayor Bruce Teague invited me to come to a meeting at his house for one of his houses uh, with uh, the uh, ex or the recently passed director of uh, public safety at the university and the. Uh, I'm not sure why I think the university still talks about their team in terms of uh, threat assessment, but the, uh, they're, they're a team coordinator. And I talked with them for an hour or so and went over a lot of issues. And so I was wondering if you considered having uh, their input in some form in making the assessments about uh, our evaluation of uh, candidates for the threat assessment position. One of the things that I, I, I took away from that meeting with them was that the institutions have to develop uh, their assessment. It's a new thing, uh, and it's it's not something that we can you know pick up really readily on our on our own. No, I think that's a great point, um, Charlie. And the, we've we've worked with them throughout the grant writing process. You know, to include that, I think we would see them as a when I talk about those external stakeholders and. Uh, who would be involved in an interview, you know, we would like to probably have them be a part of that too and see their availability to do that. So we'll want to keep talking to them, of course. Okay, thank you. What, do you, what are you, um, so you have, you said 20 or 30? Yeah, we're kind of in that 20 to 30 range. I think 25 to maybe to be exact. But so what do you yeah. want to whittle it down to? 21 maybe that completed the whole thing, so okay. yeah. Well, you know, anytime we, we have a group like that, I mean, you know, if you're looking at an interview, four to five is usually that range you're in, but you know, if we have eight great ones, then we'll maybe have to stage it a couple different formats. So I think we want, we want to just make sure we, we do a good broad look and 
yeah. you know, that we don't discount anybody on surface value, but also make sure we bring in people that are viable candidates, so. Great. I'm glad you got a lot of interest in the position. It's yeah. good. Anything else? Um, we'll move to the next topic, uh, which is around the superintendent transition process. First, Steve, congratulations. Um, Green Bay is lucky to have you. Um, and I know that was an interesting process and we had a lot of support throughout it and just wanna say congratulations again. Um, and now we are looking at it as a board, um, what we're going to do going forward. Um, it, there was a, a couple topics to, to talk about tonight. One is um, a, an approach around an interim superintendent, um, and then the second item is around what that process will look like to search for the permanent uh, position. So on the interim position, we had a work session before the holidays, uh, and we discussed as a board and came to an agreement, but there were two members not present at that discussion, so we just wanted to bring it up again tonight and make sure that we were all on board with the direction of using um, an interim superintendent approach um, for this next school year while we go through the process of a, of a thorough um, search uh, for the permanent position. So I think Paul and Lisa, you were not at that work session. Just wanted to make sure that y'all were supportive in, of that approach. I mean, Don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but I mean, just I we're felt not. bad that. <laughs> yeah, it, but, at this point, you almost have to be. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I agreed. We we don't have timeline really to get to do a search process for a per, sort of permanent. But just again, because you weren't present at that work session, just wanted to confirm that. Um, the only, the other thing I'd like to confirm the board's intent around is that we're looking to fill the interim role with an internal district candidate, um, and I think there's a lot of benefits with that. Um, there's knowledge. There's ease of transition. We've got a lot of things that are in flight that we want to, don't want to lose momentum on. Um, and so, um, and for me, that's a, 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 a very important factor. Um, and then, and, and so just any other thoughts on appointing from internal uh, district staff for this interim role? I'm, I'm totally in favor of that. I think one thing that we need to take into account is, uh, as we go through our budget priorities, is what that Absolutely. ESC staff looks like yep. next year and how that's going to impact the budget. Yep, um, and that actually then starts speaking to timing for when we want to appoint the interim superintendents because there's likely, if it's from the internal, we're going to probably have backfill and other kind of uh, staffing matters that we need to consider. So um, I would like to suggest that we we shoot for going through this interim uh, appointment process and, and reach a conclusion no later than the end of April. So then we can, one, it gives us time for some transition with Steve, um, just to make sure all the you know uh, initiatives are handed over. Um, and I think it would still be in time to inform some of the staffing budgeting questions that we would have um, from you know, other transitions in the district. Well, uh, that makes sense to me. I'm really well, interested in having a, a, us going ahead as quickly as we can on these various steps because we have um, search team to select or search firm to select as well as a for public the, input process for the permanent but, one yeah I'll come to that in just a moment because uh, you're right there's steps on that and so um, in terms of the process for the interim um, actually Sean and I had talked about you know um, having quick conversations with folks in the district who are qualified to be superintendents um, so that we you know seek people's input on interest and, and desire um, and then following and we would try to get through that very quickly uh, here in the next few days, um, and then um, uh, invite interested candidates to request a closed session of the board, perhaps even as early as March 24, so that as the board we can have conversations around uh, internal candidates and their um, uh, qualities for the particular uh, interim role. Does that sound reasonable for Sean and I to take that next step and, and talk to folks in the district? It does to me. I, the only thing I would suggest is I'm not sure who all in the district is qualified and how many people are close to being qualified, but I think that we should set a date that you would have to be qualified by, you know, April 30th. Well, that to be I, considered for the or, or something so that I think that's right because, so that we set because a, of the timeline that we're on under. That. Yeah, Correct. I agree. I don't think there's a lot in the district. I think it's maybe five or six. I think from the input I got from Steve and but it's but we would want to be thorough and thoughtful and have conversations with district leaders and and that's that's the process that we were proposing um, to the board tonight. And again, to do it as quickly as possible and understanding that broader timeline, Lisa, that's good. Um, so, yeah, so ideally, Sean and I have our marching orders. Uh, we'll get busy scheduling some conversations with folks, and then our, our goal would be to have a first closed session, and we can talk about this in an agenda setting, uh, in the March 24th meeting. Um, if we need to, we can have another one at the early, the first April meeting, but the goal would be for us to be voting on the interim superintendent by the second meeting in April. 
Sound okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so then the permanent role, the permanent position, um, you know, through conversations, it's clear that search firms are still kind of rounding out work, filling superintendent roles for the 2020-21 school year. And so uh, given we're moving forward with an interim superintendent approach, I don't, I'm not feeling a huge sense of urgency to go find a search firm today. I think we want them to round out the work they're doing, finish it up. Um, that gives us time over the summer to put an RFP together. Um, uh, get that RFP out, you know, it, with the goal of selecting a firm perhaps by the end of August. I'm just throwing some dates out. Over the summer, also, we'd want to identify um, who would be on a search committee um, for this process. I think that's going to be really important. Um, clearly, we need board member input and, and representatives of the district, ICEA. We've got critical committees that, that are strong advocates, like the Equity Committee. We've also got the Mental Health Special Education Disability Advocacy Group. I mean, I think we're going to want as a board to talk about the voices that we would want on that search committee to help us um, uh, select a search firm and then also get into the um, actual uh, search process itself. So um, I'm thinking June-ish, we would start having some work sessions to talk about the composition of the search committee, help us put together, start putting together what that RFP would look like get the RFP out sometime in the July-ish time frame with the goal of having a search firm on board by the end of August. So as school kicks off, uh, they can come in and start working with the district, um, developing that profile of our district and what you know, the, the, the qualities of an ideal candidate would look like. And then early you know, in the school year, September, October, we could actually start getting out into that search process. I think that gives us a real head start on it. And ideally, it would help us um, glean good candidates. And the portrait of a graduate process should be finished by yeah it should be done by may right by may report coming to the board in june yeah that's good yeah. i think that's going to yeah. help us with this profile of our district and what our goals are where we're going i mean i think that's actually an important thing to have in front of us as we seek a superintendent yeah. Yeah. i just want to weigh in because we i've already had a couple of conversations around this and i i feel the kind of this sense of urgency like we've got a figure out who it's going to be now. That's just sort of this general sense out there, but I, I think the timing of it with some of these search firms out there are finishing up their work for next school year, and if we try to jump into that pool right now, I think we're gonna not get great candidates and it won't be a good process. So I, I think the timeline that we put in there kind of puts us at the front of the line for the following year, and it sets us up to be much more successful in our search. Um, so I know there are going to be folks out there saying we need to get moving a lot faster than what we're proposing, but I, I don't know that that serves us. I think we need to take these steps and then, you know, do the work, and, and hopefully from the point where we, you know, get our search firm in place, and, you know, we, we have it done early enough within next school year um, to, to make it worthwhile for everyone. But I, I think it's important to follow all those steps at that yeah. time. That's what I was gonna say. I think if we, but I, I want us to be careful so that we are ready to hit the ground in the fall so we can be positioned in kind of that number one spot to get the largest applicant pool um, possible. Yeah, I agree. That's why we'll have some work over the summer, work sessions and, and whatnot to get that search committee together. <clears throat> just, just, you're running through this really quick. That's so good. Uh, but then, so we look, start looking uh, at putting an RFP together for a search firm in the early summer? Or, I'm thinking work sessions or, in June. June, okay. Okay. Steve, just, uh, maybe this is kind of a different take, but uh, do you know um, Cedar Rapids obviously just went through this process, but I don't think they hired a search firm. Is that correct? No, they did not. And they, that, I mean, they they had the interim. They had an they interim ended up with the interim because yes. that's what they decided. But do you know how that process went? That they decided they didn't want to go with the search firm. Uh, they went with a two-year interim, and that gave them the opportunity to do a full year of evaluation of that person in the interim role. Uh, and at the conclusion of that uh, year, uh, then they uh, spoke with Noreen, who's now there full-time superintendent, um, about the second year of that process, and then they went through an evaluation and made the selection. I think that's something as we're having these closed sessions around the interim superintendent, if that's something directors would like to consider, I think that's the time for us to have those conversations, the, the term of the role. Um, so 
Um, so I think, I mean, this group is gonna be the decision-making group for how we manage that uh, interim role, so. And we do have some choices. Anything uh, else? It's an interesting uh, perspective, Paul. I wasn't aware that Cedar Rapids had uh, gone through that, uh, that kind of process. So. Anything else on this one? All right, so Sean, we have our marching orders here for the next few days and um, look forward to the next board meeting. We're not going to Des Moines tomorrow, so maybe we can. <laughs> People have time. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we'll move into director liaison reports. Anything folks would like to comment on? I just wanted to make a comment that Sean and I read against each other today at Corville Central. It was really fun. And uh, just based on uh, peer votes that people report back to us, I feel pretty good. So, Despite my best attempt at uh, an Australian accent, I, th I think Paul oh. uh, won the day. Still it's undefeated. all the book. It's all the book. It's not Still undefeated, Paul? Is that? Uh, we'll find I mean, against board members. Gosh. I did share with them. I did find a way to win, and that is if uh, I went to Van Allen today and I got to read both books. Nice. So then, then you're a winner, <laughs> regardless nice. of which one they pick. I, I failed to get my uh, my activities in, um, but one thing I did want to just briefly comment on was a was a forum that ICAD and ICR put together. I think ICAD was the main organizer, um, and Matt spoke at it, and I was on the panel and. I'll just note that it was it was really heartening that so many members of our community would come out at 7:30 in the morning to talk about education. Um, representatives of not just uh, Iowa City District but Solon and Clear, uh, Clear Creek, uh, Dan Clay from University of Iowa, and um, and a lot of folks in the audience. And and it's it's it makes me feel optimistic that the work we're doing with Portrait of a Graduate is going to mobilize that that energy our district has around public education. And um, I thought it was a great event. And um, Again, I think uh, we're moving in a, good, in a good direction with our district. People really care about our schools and our students. Anything else folks would want to comment on? I have, I have three quick things. One, uh, I will say I went back to work after reading, and I told everybody at work it was the most stressful thing I've ever had to do in my life. Uh, having 60 little kindergartners stare at you, is, it's very intimidating. <laughs> I don't know how teachers do it, quite honestly. I've talked to a, a room full of adults all day long, but... That was one kid giving a side eye the whole time. Anyway, uh, the, on, uh, let's say I put it on here. On, on the 5th, uh, the district's Kids Sing Festival happened where they, they bring kids from, I think, all the elementary. I think it's 5th and 6th graders. And they all got together and, and worked on some songs and then did a little concert at the CCPA. And it's only their third year in existence. And I went to that, and it was really fun. And the, it was packed. Um, like there were very few empty seats in there and they had somewhere around a hundred kids up on stage singing. They had the first piece they were lined up in the aisles uh, singing in rounds and stuff. So they did some pretty uh, pretty tough work really uh, for having kind of one day to practice. They got the music ahead of time right and they they practice it you know by themselves or in their own schools but as a, as a whole group it was pretty impressive and really fun thing and we don't get to do a lot of fun stuff, you know, as we sit up here and talk about, you know, all these heavy things that it's kind of fun to do book readings and choir concerts and things like that. So I just wanted right, to mention yeah, that. Right. The, one other thing I wanted to mention was just to confirm that tomorrow is a DPO meeting in the evening. And I wanted to make sure we had people there because, uh, you know, they... Having been a DPO person, there was one meeting that I uh, was president at and we had no board members show up and I was kind of disappointed so uh -huh. I want to just make sure that we have people I think Lisa's, Lisa's I'm going. going for sure I'm going all right, right. Candace, Shirley's okay. representing yeah. us at the equity committee that, well the equity committee is not meeting tomorrow night oh well, they canceled all. equity that's right, right. So, so I think so, Athena was a third person so if you want to go to the DPO meeting I think you can and well, then we still go only have three you have to do the I reports. cannot go oh. so oh. Well, yeah so somebody's got to do the 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 board update well, and, and not me getting board. grilled. So, <laughs> I mean, it's easy. Yeah, everybody's. Oh, easy. I'll I'll let them know that Ruthina was going to do it, but she's home with <laughs> with some sickness, and we're not sure what it is. And then no one will talk to us <laughs> for the rest of the meeting. Cough once or twice. Everyone will stay between y'all. Three of y'all, you, you can get it covered. Oh, no, no. <laughs> we got people going. That's that's all I wanted to make sure was happening. So. I I just want to uh, make one comment about uh, uh, um, this weekend. I went to. Uh, a, a group of parents who have uh, uh, are maintaining a dyslexia awareness support group and book club, and uh, th they are aware now that we're 
switching to our uh, doing staff training for uh, uh, looking at Orton Gillingham uh, type methods for uh, uh, reading, and uh, they're very they're very uh, happy that we've taken that step. So I really commend that. Uh, <clears throat> I also asked them to call Amy and get with her and kind of work, the, you know, the, as a means of get their gathering information about how the transition is going to go. So. Uh, uh, Sorry, she's not here tonight, so she could hear that in person, but uh, um, maybe you could pass that on to we her. We will definitely share that with her. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And tell her I apologize for giving her more work to do. So. <laughs> Anything else? Um, real quick, um, I did go to a, an open house with Senator Walls uh, on Sunday. Uh, it's not on here. So um, it's something I've been keeping tabs on is this therapeutic classroom bill. Uh, passed out of the Senate unanimously. Uh, I haven't talked to Representative Masher, who is on the Ed Committee in the House, about changes. Uh, so it's going to create a grant, um, $2 million, uh, or maybe $2.5 million statewide uh, for schools to compete for these therapeutic classrooms. I, I think we'd be a good district to, to apply for that grant and establish a model of what these look like. You know, I don't know what the guidance from the DE is going to be about what these are going to look like, but um, I think it's an opportunity to do something really well. Um, I think they're meeting, and maybe at least, you know, um, possibly this summer they're going to have a special ed interim committee to talk about statewide how we step in and out of those classrooms, how that works, how that looks in special ed. Uh, I don't know if that bill has passed, but if it does, it's going to set that committee up this summer to really answer a lot of these sort of thorny, thorny questions. Um, and I don't know, it's also going to include a piece about training, uh, giving teachers the tools. Again, right now it looks like pre-service teachers, but it is going to give teachers a much wider latitude to lay hands on kids uh, and be totally immune from civil or criminal penalty. It's a very strong language, and it's going to make the burden of proof for parents very high indeed to, to say that something went wrong. And so uh, just being knowledgeable of that, that we're prepared in the summer to kind of educate our teachers. We're not going to put everybody through safety care training. That would be um, impossible and prohibitively expensive. However, what can we do to make, make sure our teachers kind of understand what the new lay of the land is once we see it and then give them some tools um, and maybe there's a shorter version of some de-escalation tools that we can give teachers. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but I, but I know the law is going to... Uh, looks like it's going to go in a direction that's going to change things um, pretty drastically for how we deal with uh, student behavior in the classroom. And I just want to put it on everybody's radar because um, it looks like it'll be here and in the fall. I think it's going to be implemented in 2021. So, so anyway, yeah. We talked a pretty good deal on Friday with the, about with it? the forum with the <laughs> Great. legislators about it. Um, so there was discussion there. Good. Okay. It's actually a good segue into legislative update. If we're ready to move on to that, um, uh, anything that we'd want to add beyond what we've talked about? We know the SSA is coming in at 2.3. and <coughs> I guess the only thing I would let you know is as we move towards the mid to second half of the ledge session, um, there is a lot of conversation right now in Des Moines about uh, getting through the second funnel and then shortening the legislative session. I think that's important for us to know just because we've got several um, and pending pieces of legislation, the one you just shared, JP, and a couple others that are in process are likely to make it through the funnel, um, but depending on whether or not the legislation, legislators choose to have an abbreviated session, um, they may not make it to the floor for final consideration. So we'll keep an eye on that and keep you up to speed. Anything else? And just in case you hadn't heard, we're, our day on the Hill was supposed to be tomorrow, and we're not doing it. Um, and I, I feel bad about that, but, you know, we had some in availability of certain key people and I think there's just you know kind of a general sense that maybe just traveling into large groups of people now is not the best idea either so we didn't have a, yeah. a lot of folks at least letting us know that we were going so we're uh, postponing I think is the idea um, but if uh, they end the session early you know it may just not yeah. be able to happen and that's unfortunate because there are a lot of things out there besides just the number and I've, I've mentioned that a couple times now that 
and maybe that's why we've had less interest as the number came in and that's the big one but there's a lot of stuff going on out there and I think we need to weigh in on whatever we feel is going to affect us as a district because there's a lot of it we'll keep an eye on things uh, as we move through spring break and we're likely to get some news out uh, in an update right after we get back from break yeah Senator Walls did say there's a lot of coughing and sniffling and sneezing going on in, in the Capitol, oh. so it might be a good idea to skip that day. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to agenda setting. Um, we've got an exempt session on the, on, on the 24th, uh, update on negotiations um, with Chase. Um, we've got a, a board meeting with a consent agenda, um, and we have lots and lots of presentations on the 24th. Um, this is our annual report on many, many parts of the district. It's interesting to get these updates. Um, really happy to see the annual climate action plan report on there. I think that's the first time that's been on there, has it? It is, and obviously we've just gotten underway, so there isn't yep. a, a year's worth of information yeah. on there, but we'll give you an update. It's nice to see that on, on that annual report cycle. Um, closed captioning costs for uh, streaming our board meetings. Um, action item on operations life cycle budget. Um, is there anything else directors want to add to the March 24th just board a meeting? Question on one of them. Dwayne, will the annual facilities master plan report uh, give us a project update then? I started by doing the current projects. Do you want past projects so I can add that? But yes. No, no, I don't want anything that's done. I just want to know stuff that's happening and right. the stuff that's starting. I feel like maybe it was just because of Grant last year. <laughs> we were here every week getting right. an update. So I just want to, just as long as that covers an overview of what's happening now and what's starting. I can guarantee there's still a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, well, I know that. I just don't need to know about the stuff that's done. All right, we'll do that for you. Thank you. Anything else for the board meeting itself? I, I will add for those reports, we are trying to do it a little bit differently than we've done in the past and take the operations side and mirror it more how we've done teaching and learning in mm -hmm. November and December. So it'll be more of one comprehensive document that has all the reports in it, like Amy and Matt have done, and then we'll just provide an overview and then let the board ask questions. And so rather awesome. than have Rather than long presentations, yes, long presentations, we'll read the material and we'll come ready with questions. Right, just so, because yeah. um, I know it says presentations, but really trying to, mo we call it presentations in the fall as well, but really model more down to that okay. report. Okay, good, it. thanks so, for that, Chase, yeah. appreciate it. Um, we've got a work session on the 24th too, which we'll talk about our LGBTQ plus policy rollout update. I think JP, you had requested this, I think mm -hmm. it's timely. And um, Yeah, I'm just know how that's going. And yeah. Um, and then one last, th oh, sorry, Quick Paul. question on that. Is it, um, JP, is that just an, uh, an update or are we bringing other people into the conversation or? The only, the only reason I ask is that I know we have, that's the only item on the work session and we just talked about having another. Closed session, closed I was session. just gonna mention that, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm just curious if that can be moved into the regular board meeting and discussed there and. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with that. And then that closed session Great. could start after the mm -hmm. board meeting. Yeah. I think it's a great idea because yeah. we hopefully will have a closed session on the uh, board, board can talk about interim superintendent. Um, so we'll want to make sure we add that. Like I always say, the positive of that going into the regular board meeting is that maybe more eyes or ears okay. will be on it. Totally. Yeah, that'll be great. Thanks. It's good, good catch. Anything else, folks, for the 24th? It's going to be uh, a busy evening. Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh. So, oh. Oh. Agenda setting, Kim. <laughs> Policy and governance, didn't we talk about setting a meeting? At 31st. Okay. At 4.30. Okay. I couldn't remember if we were the week before or not. Okay. All right. That's it. So I think we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's so cold in here.